Mike here. I invite you to open your Bibles in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 and 19. This is what I have observed to be good, that it, it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their, in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and happy in their toils, this is a gift of God. And now I will read it in Spanish. Los invito a que abran sus Biblias en el libro de Eclesiastes, capítulo 5, versículo 18 y 19. Y dice así, He aquí pues el bien que yo he visto, que lo bueno es comer y beber, y gozar uno del bien del trabajo, de su trabajo con que se fatiga debajo del sol, todos los días de su vida que Dios le ha dado, porque esta es su parte, asimismo, a todo hombre a quien Dios da riquezas y bienes, y le da también la facultad para que coma de ellas, y tome su parte, y goce de su trabajo, esto es don de Dios. Que el Señor bendiga su palabra. May the Lord bless his word. Thank you, thank you so much, honey, appreciate that. That was uh, very, very beautifully done. Okay, so we're going to have our praises and requests, and uh, I hear my phone, I feel it vibrating here, so I want to share some praises and requests with you um, at this time. I've got, uh, I have to scroll down because there's so many of you that are doing this, so thank you so much. Um, this comes from Ricky, and her request is for continuing prayers for the protection of all the doctors and nurses and healthcare uh, providers, EMTs, hospitals, etc., that God will watch over them. And we are with you on that, Vicki, so much. Uh, Judy Long praises uh, the Lord for a wonderful Zoom meeting last night. It was a blessing. Uh, again, we, we talked a little bit about uh, Noah's Ark. And uh, she's also asking for prayer for her aunt Janet, uh, her health problems. So uh, Judy will pray for your aunt Janet and her health problems. Uh, Rick Waugh uh, uh, says that he misses his church family. Rick, we miss you too. And we miss all of our church family meeting publicly. Um, yesterday, by the way, my wife and I went to visit some members in their homes. Not in their homes, but, uh, well, one insisted that we go into their home. Um, but we kept our distance and we had our masks on. And it was just so good to see some of you. It really, really was. And, and so that was our joy and pleasure. Uh, but Rick misses his church family, but he's blessed to have them in his heart this Sabbath. So Rick, again, we're with you with, with that, and we have you in our heart too. Um, Les prays, uh, wants us to pray for Daniel and his family for salvation at the, um, the uh, Veterans Hospital. And so let's pray for Daniel and his family, please, people. Uh, Joe Guzman, G Guzman uh, prayer and blessings from the uh, Guzman family, Lydia and Araceli and Joey. And uh, so I'm glad, we're glad that you're tuning in and blessings to the three of you. Um, Juliet, another member of our church, and she's got an army back home with her, her husband and all of her kids. Uh, she prays God for, let's see, am I reading? That was uh, this morning. She prays to the Lord for her dad's PSA coming down, his cancer. He's doing pretty good. So we need to continue to pray for Juliet's dad, but, dad, but we pray uh, we praise for that. And for a friend named Ruthie. Ruthie is in the hospital this morning with seizures of an unknown cause. So we need to pray for Ruthie's, for all of those of you who are... In fact, you know what? I would encourage all of you to write these on a piece of paper because you're not going to remember all of these names. And uh, so let's pray for, for Ruthie, Juliet's friend. And she praises God for being able to pay off two more debts. That's a good one. That's a good praise. It's always good to, to pay off those debts. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline Van Sant, again, happy anniversary, Jacqueline. Uh, she praises Jim and Linda. Were, um, she praises God. They were in a minor car accident yesterday, but they're okay. We're thankful for that. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Julie Silva, um, she um, asks for um, 
uh, prayer request for Helen. Those, that's the person that we visited, one of the people, Helen. Uh, she fell off of her bike on Tuesday, and so we continue to pray for Helen's recovery. She broke her right so shoulder, but she was in good spirits. We went to go see her yesterday. She was in very, very good spirits, and she's walking, and so we praise the Lord for that. And um, this comes from my sister Diana um, in California. Uh, she's thankful to the Lord for her job. She's working from home full-time, and she's thankful and praises the Lord for good health and for family. We praise the Lord for you too, sister and yeah, we thank you for that. And then, um, now this is probably the, uh, other than the Lord Jesus and other than my wife, this comes from the most important person in my life, and that's our son. And he's saying uh, to pray for Stephanie and her, especially her niece who is getting interested in uh, the things of the Bible. And what is her, the niece's name? I can't remember. But we did, but my wife and I were praying exactly for this the other day. And so we pray for Stephanie. We pray for the niece. I think she's seven, eight years old. And if you're watching niece, we're praying for you that Jesus will be in your heart and that you will love him with all of your heart. And what was that? And of course, and Stephanie and, and, and your mom too, Stephanie. And uh, Ashley, that's her name. My son put it here. And uh, we want to pray for our son tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, our son, uh, Ray, is going into a facility where there's COVID-19 happening in there. And of course, he has all of his PPE. So son, we are praying for you. We prayed last night. I prayed last night for this. I shared this with uh, Friday night Zoom, um, our people that joined us in our Zoom, and that was part of my prayer request. So son, we are praying for you. And I would ask uh, that everybody pray for my son as well as he goes into this uh, this danger, danger zone. Amen. You uh, ask one more. Birthday, we can give thanks God for another birthday. Robert's mom, Beverly. Oh. Her birthday was on the 14th. Oh, and okay. Ishmael's birthday will be next week. We praise the Lord that yes. he uh, will. Okay, and we praise the Lord. Uh, Beverly, who is the Robert's mom. Robert's our cameraman behind the camera. Beverly's birthday was on the 14th. So Beverly, happy birthday to you. And then also uh, my nephew in Tucson, Ishmael, it's his birthday next week. So we want to wish you a happy birthday, Ishmael. Okay, so that uh, covers the, what I have so far on my telephone. And I would add to that, again, let's pray for our own um, faith and encouragement during this crisis. Um, you know, sometimes you can get tired of hearing the news. That's all what the news is about, is, uh, is the coronavirus. And w we all understand because it's so important and it's such a huge deal. It's not a small deal as some people thought back in January. It is a huge deal. And so, um, but let's pray for those people who are the frontline workers, as was mentioned, and pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones. Um, our heart and, and condolences go out to them. But let's pray for us to keep hope. This will be over. This will be over. We're looking uh, forward to the future with hope and with faith and with trust in God. And, and so let's pray for our spirits, for what's going on in here. For those who have lost jobs, I'm going to talk a little bit about that this morning. For those who have lost jobs and don't know where their next meal is coming from and and food is hard to come by in some of these food banks. Let's pray for all of those individuals. And I would say we need to pray for us because those of us who have plenty, those of us who can do something, let's pray that we can share compassion and love for those who are needy and we can do something about it. A lot of people are doing good things, um, whether it's you know, just calling people or uh, we, I was watching the news the other day. Um, somebody was taping this guy in New York. <clears throat> he was in a New York apartment. It looked like from the vantage point of the camera, it was probably on the fourth floor. Took out his electric guitar and was playing the national anthem on his electrical guitar. We saw that in the news last night. And one of his neighbors was out in the balcony filming him. Just the way of encouraging people and bringing hope. Simply just playing his guitar on his balcony in the New York streets. Um, and pray for the policemen. Uh, uh, my wife and I were driving yesterday, visiting people, and there was a couple of policemen parked there, and we stopped and we prayed for them. We offered them food, which is what we were doing yesterday, and prayed for them. My wife prayed for them, so let's pray for our police officers. 
Okay, so why don't we go ahead and bow our heads at this time. I'm going to kneel here on the platform, and I would invite you to kneel, if you can, where you are here uh, in, in our sanctuary. Kneel if you can, and uh, let's have a word of prayer at this time. Lord Jesus, we thank you because you are a mighty God. You are always in control. You always have been. You're on your throne. You see what is happening. You know what will happen before it comes. And we thank you, God, that you are the sovereign of this world and of our universe. And we praise you, Heavenly Father, that you know exactly what you're doing. And we can trust you. We can trust our days, our presence, and in our, in our futures into your hands. We thank you, God, that you are omnipresent everywhere at the same time. We thank you that you are omniscient. You know everything. Your knowledge is perfect. But Father, above everything else, we praise you because the Bible says that you are love. Amen. And we love you, God. We thank you for loving us even while we were yet sinners and your enemies. Your word says that Jesus died for us. So we thank you, God, for being a God of love and a God of personal relationships. You are here with us. We thank you for that. God, we come to you confessing our sins. We come to you bringing, bringing them to you of any sins that we have committed this week. We pray, Lord, as a church body, that you will grant us your pardon. We believe in the shed blood of Jesus that provides forgiveness, and so we confess all of our sins to you, Jesus. Lord, we come to you with gratitude in our hearts. Even though times are very hard and there are people that are always better off and always worse off than we are, and even though we see these things on the news and how this pandemic has affected each of us, Lord, it has come home and it has affected all of us, there are many reasons that we are grateful to you, Lord. And we're grateful to you for our health, um, we're grateful to you for those people that are um, working and doing their best uh, during this crisis. We thank you for church family. We thank you for our children. We thank you for our lives, Lord. We thank you for technology. Um, people are listening to me right now, and they're not even here present. We thank you for technology. We thank you for Robert, our cameraman. Thank you for my wife and my son. So many reasons to be thankful for our homes and for our jobs. And even though some of us have lost our jobs, we thank you for life. And we thank you for what we do have, God. We bring to you certain requests, Lord, and um, you know each name. Um, but we, uh, we pray for these um, frontline workers, Lord. Uh, we want to pray for, um, for Judy's Aunt Janet. Uh, we pray, Lord Jesus, for all of our families. I want to pray for Daniel and his family at the VA hospital. Um, Lord, we want to pray for uh, Juliet's uh, father. We praise you that he's doing much better, but we still continue to pray for him and for her friend Ruthie, who is in the hospital with uh, seizures, of uh, mysterious seizures. Um, we pray, Lord, we thank you for Jim and Linda in this minor accident, but they're okay. We Thank you so much, Lord. Uh, of course, it could have been worse. Um, we pray for Helen, that you will continue to heal her shoulder. Um, Lord, uh, we pray uh, for uh, my son, that you will protect him, and of course, these other workers, but protect him as he works tomorrow in this uh, environment where there is the virus. We pray, Lord, for Stephanie, and we pray for Ashley, that uh, you will move in their hearts and that you will be more real to them than they have ever experienced before. Um, Lord, we want to pray for people that are homebound and um, that uh, people will call them. We thank you for Zoom, Lord. My own mom is homebound, and I thank you that I've been able to see her twice a week via Zoom. And it's great, but we pray for those people who are shut in that don't have anybody. And um, we pray that you will move on our hearts to call them and to just say hello. We pray for all of those people. 
Lord, I'm sure I missed somebody, but I pray that you will be with all of them. Praise the Lord for birthdays, for anniversaries, and, um, and so much to be grateful for. Lord, last but not least, again, would you bless our service this morning in the message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, I want to thank you so much for uh, texting and giving all of your praises and requests um, on my, uh, my telephone. And I'm sure I'll probably receive a little bit more in uh, just a little bit. So uh, if we don't get to those, we'll include those for next Sabbath. I'd invite you to open your Bibles to begin with in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, I am going to do some fast talking this morning because I do want to read um, a good selection of verses for this morning's topic. Now, if you were to look on the screen, uh, the sermon, the title to my sermon this morning is Whatever is Whatever. Um, and what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at Ecclesiastes. That is such a fascinating book. Uh, because you'll be surprised at some of the things you find in there, and they're very counterintuitive, some of the things that you find in the book of Ecclesiastes. We can't just be selective and select what parts of the Bible agree to us and what parts of the Bible don't agree so much or we're confused or we may even disagree and we just set those aside. You can't do that with God's Word. So what I'm going to do this morning is include some of these verses that may be a little bit confusing uh, or, or troublesome uh, to some. And, um, and then we're going to look at some lessons at the very end. Bring all of these passages together, and then I want to offer just three simple points or lessons um, as a result of reading um, these texts. I want to start, however, by sharing a graph with you on the screen. So I'm going to invite Robert to uh, switch the camera to the screen. Um, unemployment in the United States, and I'm saying this by way of introduction to my topic uh, this morning. Unemployment in the United States <coughs> as a result of COVID-19 is um, amazingly uh, huge and rampant the world over. Now this is just describing the United States. Right here on the top of the screen, the historic U.S. job losses in perspective um, what this particular website uh, is calling the Great Lockdown. The unemployment that the United States has experienced right now is as a result of what is called, quote unquote, the Great Lockdown. Now, if you look on this, and I, um, can you, is that zoomed in, Robert? Can they see that? Okay. So if you look at this, you have the top here, the, uh, the uh, timeline, 1970 all the way to 2020. And right here, if you look here, in 1975, stagflation, remember those gas lines? Uh, remember, we had to wait in gas. Depending on the last number of your license, at least in California, Los Angeles, according to the, your license plate, if it was an odd or even number, whether it began or ended with a number, you can go to the gas station. That's, I remember that. But this is 1975. 2.2 million people unemployed, which was 1% at that time of the U.S. population. And then down here in 1980, the Volcker tightening, 2.5 million uh, unemployed people, which is 1.2% of the population. Then you have 1982, you come here to 1991. This is one, one is going to interest us. The Great Recession of 2009, remember the housing booms? 2.6 million people unemployed, which was 0.9% of the U.S. population. And it says here, unemployment peaked at 10% in October 2009 and did not return to pre-recession levels until 2016. So this is recent. Look at this big one. This is 2020, the great lockdown. 22 million people unemployed at an unprecedented 6.7% of our population. Job losses in the last four weeks were up to 10 times higher than previous peak periods. This is absolutely astounding. Um, there is room for optimism, however. I want to read a, a few things from, um, from this uh, website. Although the initial jobless claims are staggering and clearly without modern precedent, there is a case made to be 
uh, to look on the positive side of things. And the reason for that is the nature of this particular um, unemployment rate that we're experiencing, uh, experiencing here in the United States because many of the other recessions uh, uh, um, that we see, saw on the chart took months or years to accumulate with peak job losses occurring at the tail end of each recession. That's the big difference between those other little circles and the big one, that those other ones took a long time to get to that point. Whereas the great lockdown, what we're experiencing today, caused many businesses to shut doors suddenly and against their will. It also corresponded with unexpected closures of national borders and the halting of regular trade activity around the world. So when and if, and I'm saying when, not if, but when, uh, normal economic, economic activity resumes, it'll be interesting to see how much of this damage is, is go, is on a, has a temporary nature to it because it started all of a sudden and God willing when businesses reopen it'll, it'll uh, disappear. That's the hope. Um, so this is what we are experiencing now. No matter what kind of job you have, no matter what you do, you can be affected. Not everyone, of course, but many, many people are affected. The other thing I want to mention that is not, um, does not relate to unemployment rates is that the current crisis is showing us that even people with PPE, personal protective equipment, even those people are dying because of the virus. And I would even say this, even people in our own church the Seventh-day Adventist Church are dying. Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Director, for one example, of the Jakarta Conference in Indonesia, his name is Biner Silalahi. Um, he died just on March 23 because of the coronavirus. And so our condolences go out to him. Um, to those who knew him, his legacy will never be forgotten. Uh, they were saying that he was just a, a, a family man. He was a devout follower of Jesus. He did a lot of good. He survived by his wife, Hatma Rolina Manik, and their marriage um, was gifted with four wonderful children. He's not the only one in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, early, earlier reports from the Adventist News Network and Adventist Review confirmed an um, Adventist member in China and another one in London had died because of this pandemic. So what do we make of all of this? People who are arduously working to do good, honest people, they end up dying because of the virus. And those frontline workers, first responders, medical professionals, in spite of having PPE, they die, which is why we are praying for our son. Um, so son, be careful. We, um, in, in fact, I need to say this about Ray. He's not forced to go, he is volunteering to go. He was asked and he volunteered. And so like many nurses and doctors that we're hearing about um, are heroes in that they're going into the thick of danger because they want to help. And so Ray, my hat's off to you. But be careful, be very, very careful. And uh, we're gonna be praying for you. Um, but although we mourn the loss of these individuals, it has a stronger sting when it hits home when we see workers in our very own church dying. Now, the Bible has something to say about laborers on earth, and this is where the book of Ecclesiastes comes in. Now, we're going to read some verses in this book. It may not be something that you may expect uh, coming from this book, but nevertheless, a very wise man, his name was Solomon, long ago, contemplated all of his labors and the fruits of them and came up with some, what we would probably see as surprising conclusions. Um, and as a side note to that, we have to read these verses carefully um, and, and prayerfully with a wise heart. So today we're going to look at these conclusions and discover important truths about our earthly activities. And I will just say this ahead of time. During this pandemic, this is a good time to reflect about what really matters in life. I'm going to repeat that. During this crisis, unemployed or not, all the things that are happening, stressed out or not, it is a good time to reflect on what really is important to you, what really matters in life. 
that's my overall umbrella point for this morning. All right, so let's go into the book of Ecclesiastes. I hope you have your Bibles open, your, your phones on. We're going to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and I want to read some uh, verses for you here, just straight from my Bible. I don't have them. In fact, actually, I think I do have them on the screen this time. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, and this is what the Bible says. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? He's saying, what's the use of being really wise if I'm going to die anyways, just like the person who is unwise and who is a fool? So I said to myself, this too is vanity, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool. And as much, and as, much as in the coming days, all will be forgotten. And how the wise man and the fool alike die. So I hated life, for the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. That's what he says. The wicked life and the righteous life end up in the same place, in the grave. So when he is contemplating his life and the fruits of his labor and the things that he was able to accomplish in life, um, that's one of the things that Solomon ended up concluding. What's the use? What's the use? We all go to the same place and fool and wise alike are all going to be forgotten. That's what he says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Second thing I want to mention from Psalms and Job is that wicked labor or wicked works is not always punished as the righteous would expect. And this is something that really picks at our sense of justice and our consciences. That those who do evil, those who are uh, doing bad, seem to get away with it. And wickedness, with its evil labors and its fruits, apparently prosper, and God does nothing about it. So open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 73, or actually it's on the screen. Open your Bibles to Job chapter 21, but we're going to look at what uh, Psalm says, and then we're going to look at what Job says. Psalm 73, verses 1 through 14, says this. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling, my steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant. What does he say? I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore his people return to this place and waters of abundance are drunk by them. Then, say, then they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence, for I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. He says, what is the use, just like Ecclesiastes of what Solomon wrote, that's what he says in verse 13, in vain I have I kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Why am I doing so good if it doesn't seem to benefit me anything while I have breath in me? And those who are doing all the evil, they seem to prosper and their tongue goes throughout the earth and they mock God and they seem to be fat and, and in plenty and not in want. Now, what do you do with verses such as this? Let's go to Job chapter 21. Job chapter 21. And let's see what Job has to say. Verse 7, Job chapter 21. This I don't have on the screen for you. Job chapter 21. And starting with verse 7, Job 21 and verse 7, I'll give you a little bit to get there. Job chapter 21 and verse 7. So we're still looking at, first I talked about the wicked life and the righteous life end up in the same place. Uh, this is what Solomon says. We're, we all end up in the, as a big pile of ashes anyway. 
And then what we're looking at now is this seemingly, this uh, absence of cause and effect. Job chapter 21 and verse 7 says this, Why do the wicked still live, Job says, continue on, also become very powerful? Their descendants are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear and the rod of God is not on them. In other words, God doesn't seem to be disciplining them. His ox mates without fail, his cow calves and does not abort. They send forth their little ones like the flock and their children skip about. They're all happy, no problems. They sing to the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the flute. They have music. They spend their days in prosperity and suddenly they go down to Sheol, which is another word for the grave. They say to God, depart from us. We do not even desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what would we gain if we entreat him? Behold, their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. This is what Job is saying to his friends. Why does it seem that the wicked prosper and those who want to do good, those who have honest jobs and who have lost them because of this COVID-19? Why does it seem that the rich, the filthy rich people don't seem to be suffering? Not that all filthy rich people are dishonest people. But some of them may be, just like there are dishonest poor people. I'm an honest worker. I have worked hard to put food on the table. I have six kids at home, and now I'm suffering, and we're going hungry. Where is my answered prayer? This is what seems to be happening in these passages. Point number three, laboring and the fruits of one's labor is a source of pleasure in satisfaction, so enjoy it. Enjoy it. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and this is what the Bible has to say. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 18. This is what Solomon says. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. This is after he got done saying, we're all going to end up in the grave anyways. And who knows, verse 19, whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labor, labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This too is vanity, and a great evil. And the verse 22, for what does a man get in all his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? What is it worth in the end? I can't take anything with me. And who knows if my son is going to be an honest and wise king as I have, and he's going to get to have all of my property and all of my army and all of my chariots and all of my silver and gold and riches. What kind of man is he going to be? This is what he's asking. What's the use? And then if you go to chapter 5, there in Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, which was our scripture reading this morning. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting. To eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself. In other words, to be merry. Eat, drink, and be merry. In all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. And you know what I say to all of this for what I've been speaking about in the past five to seven minutes? Whatever. Some people may come away with that conclusion. Whatever. What good is it? What use is it? What value is there in hard work and in honest labor if I'm going to die anyways like the person who stole and who raped and who plundered and who was evil? We all end up in the same place. Whatever. Whatever. What difference does it make then? Whether we seek to do good or bad or are hard workers or not, we all end up in the same place a pile of ashes, whatever. What difference does it make living a good life or bad life of being an honest worker or not? What difference does it make? 
because apparently we can't understand all of this anyway. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 13 through 17 says this. This is what he says. Consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has bent? In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Did you see that? One perishes and the other um, dies, or the other uh, prospers. And this is where he concludes that understanding the happenings of earth is impossible. It's hard to understand how all of these things work out. So the conclusion I want to share with you this morning is that King Solomon is saying that no man can fully understand why things are they, or the way they are in this world. Why does it seem that injustice prevails and honesty and righteousness end up staying in the dark and not being rewarded in this life? These are things that Solomon is contemplating after a long life of fruitful labor. And he's saying, I just don't get it sometimes. You can just see him sitting on his throne with uh, you know, his chin in his hand like the thinker and contemplating for hours on end and coming away with this conclusion. I just don't understand why all of this is so. And what he is saying about eating, drinking, and enjoying oneself I need to mention this. It's not hedonism where he says, eat, drink, and be merry in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, the scripture reading. It's not hedonism, which is the mere pursuit of pleasure and self-indulgence. That's not his point. What he means is that it is God's gift to enjoy honest labor because there is value in our honest toil. So enjoy its fruits. That's the point that he is making. Why? Because it's going to end. We're going to get cut off. Or we're going to die. And if you're an honest man, enjoy the fruits of your labor. However, the thing to keep in mind is that we will all give an account to God. We will all give an account to God. Now, there is another perspective from all of this that I shared with you in the past 10 or so minutes. There is another perspective, and it's an eternal perspective an eternal perspective. In Psalm 73, um, this is Asaph who wrote this particular psalm. Now before I shared with you his complaints and his confusion and his frustration, why is it that the wicked prosper, etc.? Well, this is what he says in verse 16 of that same chapter. When I pondered to understand this, Asaph says, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. Now, wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree that it is troublesome to see some of the things the way they are happening in this world today? And the innocent die, those with PPE die, they're just trying to help other people, etc. And he's saying, all of this is troublesome to me. And then he says this in verse 17, until I came into the sanctuary of God, until I came into the sanctuary, then I perceived their end. You see, there's a paradigm shift. There's a shift in his thinking, in his perspective. After um, meditating and evaluating and analyzing life and the things that happen in life and the unanswered questions that we have, he says he went into God's sanctuary and he started really thinking about this. Apparently, a switch of locale and a switch of heart and of mind to consider things from an eternal perspective uh, made him see things in a different light. Verse 18, Surely you, capital Y, meaning God, surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakens, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and arrogant. Then I was senseless and, and, excuse me, and ignorant, not arrogant, and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. 
Now, let me repeat those verses. Verse 21, when my heart was embittered and I was pierced, and I was pierced within, or um, literally it's in my kidneys, when his gut was just troubling him because of the things that he saw in life. And he was embittered and he was frustrated at what he said earlier in the first half of chapter 73. When all of these things, what he says here is, then I was senseless and ignorant. And this is what often happens in our lives today. In crisis, in troubles, when there's confusion, when there's just questions that just we cannot have answered in this life. God will not always answer our questionings and our musings when there are things that we just can't figure out. What the psalmist is saying here is that the danger is that there was senselessness and ignorance, and the reason for that is we just cannot see the whole picture. We cannot see the whole picture. It is impossible for finite beings to see things and perceive things and analyze things and manage things as God does from his divine perspective. And verses 23 and 24, Nevertheless, he says, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. In fact, going back to uh, Ecclesiastes and chapter 11, if you go back over there, um, this is what Solomon says. Ecclesiastes 11, verses 9 and 10. This is what Solomon says. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood. And follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Yet know, he says, that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So, remove grief and anger from your heart. Remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. And don't we know that very well? Those of us of older, gener uh, older age, we know that very well that they are fleeting. And then he concludes his book. After all of his... Um, st struggles um, in his mind and his soul to understand why things happen the way they do on earth and why so much just seems to be vain. And the, the overarching understanding of Ecclesi Ecclesiastes is that things are transient. They're very temporal, a very temporal nature of our lives and what we do in this life. Um, and this is his conclusion in chapter 12. In verses 13 and 14, this is what Solomon says. The conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. This is the eternal perspective after trying to just figure earthly life out and why this person escapes by doing this and why this person doesn't escape by doing this, why this good person seems to suffer, not all the time, and why this bad person seems to not suffer, but not all the time. The eternal perspective is that in going to God, coming into His sanctuary, that can have the effect of coming to our senses in the and in, in receiving an eternal perspective and this is what the wise man says this is what solomon says in ecclesiastes just remember it's good to have a job it's good to labor it's good to enjoy the fruits of your labor it's good to have a family it's good to have, be alive etc etc it's good to do this and that but just remember in the end they all come to that same climax in the end. Remember, God will judge everything that is done while we have breath in our lungs, while we have life in us. So what are the lessons? I want to share with you three lessons um, in uh, considering all of these verses that we looked at this morning. Number one, <clears throat> number one, 
who you are as a human being should not be defined by your employment or by your economic status. Repeat that to yourself. Who you are as a human being should not be defined <coughs> by your employment or economic status. Now, as I shared with you earlier today, unemployment is going through the roof. And as a result, many people are experiencing stress, discouragement, and even anger. Others are hopeful. Um, some of you undoubtedly saw in the news the other day where people in different states are protesting for their uh, state governor to reopen businesses. We saw the lines. We saw the, we saw the headlines. We saw those, those videos of the people with those uh, big cards. Um, and uh, some people may be angry. There's a lot of stress um, added to this uh, pandemic. There's the stress pandemic that is added to the virus pandemic. But when you lose thousands of dollars of businesses like dairy farmers, uh, again, this has been in the news where they've been having to dump thousands of gallons of milk because schools are closed and restaurants are closed and so milk demands are down. They've had to dump all of this milk. Um, it's very disheartening. Thousands of dollars are being lost. People need to put food on the table for their families and now they are struggling worldwide. So I am not minimizing the frustration or duress millions of people um, are experiencing. And I still have my job. I still have my job. So I wouldn't blame anyone to point that out to me. Well, you still have your job. It's easy for you to say all of this. I am not minimizing um, the pain and the suffering and the tears and the heartache and, and just the frustration and worry of many people losing their jobs and, um, and just life has put a, uh, thrown them a, a, a curveball. Uh, just things are different nowadays. Things are different because of this. So I'm not minimizing it at all in any way um, your, your pain. But I would encourage us to remember that the kind of person I am should not be defined by my job. Whatever job I have or I don't have, I should be the same person in substance. I should be the same person in here. For example, if I were to suddenly come into wealth, or if I were to work hard for it over the years with blood, sweat, and tears, I need to be a person of integrity, of honesty, of compassion, of unselfishness. What I value in life, those things that are most important in life, should be of an eternal nature. In other words, relationships, a circumspect character, um, being the same person alone as I am with the company that I'm with, regardless of what kind of company that is, these are the attributes that will determine my eternal destiny. What kind of person I am? Let me share a text with you in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. This is Jesus saying this. Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Now, I understand the context. Jesus is talking about somebody who, uh, and then he gives an example after this, somebody who hoards goods. And then by hoarding goods because his business is going very well, it's bursting at the seams, you know, just business is good. He amasses uh, wealth and, and hoards uh, supplies and then relaxes and drops his guard and says, now I can eat, drink, and be merry because my future, after all, is secure. I have all of this money in the bank. What's going to happen to me? This is what Jesus is warning against in that context. And so I understand that. But I want to use that verse and apply it in a different way. Who you are and how much you have or what you don't have, that's not what defines you. The kind of job you have, or if you are jobless, if you are homeless, that's not what should divine, define us as a human being, as a person. I can, I can share with you some things uh, that a famous uh, 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 celebrity, Hollywood celebrity, I told my wife was one of her patients and what has told her. I can share with you some things that I have seen in homeless people. Uh, you know, seemingly, I don't know them, but honest people. In fact, let me just give you one example. <clears throat> just the other day, I went to Walmart. 
And coming out of the store, I wear my mask, by the way, and in my car door, <clears throat> first thing I do when I open my car door, I have a little bottle of hand sanitizer. I sanitize my hands, and then I touch the steering wheel and the gear shift, et cetera, and my keys and my phone. And so I'm, I'm, I protect myself. But as I was going out to the car, um, I was just about at my car, and excuse me, sir, I turn around, and there was this young kid. He must have been in his 20s. Uh, he was no older than 28. And uh, his clothes were all dirty. I mean, just really, really dirty. And I knew that he uh, did not have any place to stay. And he had a bottle of Windex in his hands. And he said, sir, can I clean your windows? I, and I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, you know. I, I said, well, okay, go ahead. And, um, and so I started chatting with him. He was cleaning my windows. Sir, can I, you want me to do all your windows? Sure. So I took out a couple of dollars. And then well, in talking with him and what he was doing and what he was saying, I won't share all of the conversation, he seemed to me just like a really honest kid that was just down on his luck uh, in an unfortunate family situation that he described with me. But he seemed to be really a nice, honest kid. Did a good job with the windows, so I took out some more cash. <laughs> I took out some more cash and I gave it to him. And I said, look, there's another person coming right there. Go try and do her windows as well. Um, seemed to be a good kid. Um, whether you don't have a job and you're living out in the streets or whether you are filthy rich, don't let what you have or don't have or what kind of job you have define the kind of person you are. There are millions of people unemployed. This is something that is hard for us guys to deal with more than I think than women because we tend to connect our personal identity with the kind of job we have and how successful we are. And that's kind of a guy thing. So I know it may be a little bit harder for us males to do this, but I encourage you for, uh, to do that. Michael Norton, a Harvard Business School professor who has studied the connections between happiness and wealth, says that research regularly points to two central questions that people ask themselves when determining whether they're satisfied with something in their life. And here are the two questions. Am I doing better than I was before? And the second one, am I doing better than other people? That's what this Harvard business professor, uh, Michael, says. This applies to wealth, but also to attractiveness, height, and other things that people tend to fret about. And this is what he says. The problem is, a lot of the things that really matter in life are hard to measure. So if you wanted to be a good parent, it's a little hard to know if you're being a better parent now than you were a year ago, and it's also hard to know if you're a better parent than the neighbors. The research Norton has conducted illustrating this phenomenon is dispiriting. In a paper published earlier this year, 2020, uh, excuse me, this, was, this comes from last year, he and his collaborators asked more than 2,000 people who have a net worth of at least $1 million dollars including many whose wealth far exceeded that threshold. The question was asked how happy they were on a scale of 1 to 10, and then how much more money they would need to get to reach a 10. Interesting survey. All the way up the income wealth spectrum, Norton, told, uh, Norton says, basically everyone says that they needed two or three times as much to be perfectly healthy. And these are individuals with a minimum of about one million um, um, uh, uh, net worth. And another expert, Brooke Harrington, who is a professor at the Copenhagen Business School, who has studied and written about the financial practices of the super wealthy, says that the question many rich people ask themselves about their money is not, do I have enough to buy this expensive thing that I want? That's not the question. They, rather, they ask, do I have as much or more than these people I'm, ke I'm keeping company with? Or I'm comparing myself with, excuse me. That's interesting. Very interesting. And so the, that's this article, which is from, uh, the, um, from the Atlantic from December of 2018, also goes into uh, talking about, well, if I'm a very rich person and I live in a neighborhood, and they're not as rich as me, then, wow, you know, I, I'm good. But if I go to another neighborhood where people are as wealthy or wealthier than I, then th it, it changes a little bit. Let me share this with you, what Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So let me repeat lesson number one. It's not who you are 
that should be tied up in the kind of job you have or whether you're unemployed or not. Seek the eternal things, relationships, being an integral person inside, being the same person you are alone as you are with whatever company you may have with you. Those are the things that matter in life. And as, as Solomon said, in the end, God will judge everything that we have said, everything that we have done, and even everything that we have thought. That's my lesson number one. Number two, from what I get from these passages, and this is number two, number three, cause and effect of good and evil as they are played out on earth do not always fit our logic or sense of justice. I'm going to tell you the truth. This frustrates me. Uh, it really does. I can relate to some of these prophets that have had the same complaint. David, Asaph, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Job. I relate to that. A few years back, I went through my uh, spiritual questionings. Um, and I don't exactly remember all of the details, but I remember um, really contemplating and analyzing the things that happen in this, this world that are detrimental and evil towards the innocent. Um, and I was just really at a hard place. I really was. And this lasted for about half a year. Um, I had to continue preaching. I had to continue my ministry. But, um, but in the background, I was having these very hard questions towards God. Why is this happening? So I can really relate to these questions and these frustrating uh, you know, give me the answer. Why is this happening? Uh, type of sentences that we find in Scripture that you can't just conveniently uh, sweep under the rug and ignore them. They're there. Um, they are there. Um, their humanity of the, the greatest of, of them, these prophets, comes out. They had the same exact questions, being who they were, as you and I do today. Cause and effect, lesson number two, cause and effect of good and evil as they are played out don't always fit our logic or sense of justice. One of the perennial questions which have plagued theology, religion, and humanity in general for thousands of years is the seeming absence of a positive correlation between good living and prosperity. If you live good, if you're an honest person, then the effect should be then it's going to go well with you. And if you do evil and you hurt other people and their property, then the cause and effect rule should say, well, then something bad is going to happen your way. That's not what these guys are saying in the Bible. That happens all the time. If it were as simple as there being absolutely no connection between one's behavior and one's prosperity or the lack thereof, then the impasse would not be so problematic. However, as Job, the classic example of the righteous sufferer, points out, and I'm going to read that verse again in Job 21, why do the wicked still live, continue on, also become very powerful? Their descendants are established in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear and the rod of God is not on them. This is a frustration. And I will say this now. We will not have all the answers in this life. Some of you hearing may, may have had this same questions on the inside, but may have had fear of expressing them for fear of appearing faithless and not trusting in God. I want to tell you, you're in good company. And the other thing that I want to say is that all of these passages that we read this morning, keep this in mind, these men were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things. They were inspired by God. So, by saying, why are the wicked prospering? Where are you, God? When, when, when will you act? When will you rise up and mete out justice to those who need to be judged? All of those questions, they were inspired by God himself to write them. So the, the point I want to make is this. God understands these deep-seated, heartfelt complaints and questions that we have. He understands them. And he allows them, this is why they were inspired to write this, he allows these human, uh, our humanity to come forth in their expressions as is written in Scripture. He allows that. He understands it. He may not answer all of our questions. They will be answered someday on the other side of eternity. But for now, 
this is my lesson number two, don't expect our sense of justice and equity and logic to always be satisfied in this world. This is what scripture points out. The last lesson I want to share with you is that God approves honest labor and pleasure, but in the end, our lives and how we live them will be judged by him. And this is what we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. So those three lessons I leave with you today. Number one, who you are as a human being should not be defined by your employment or your economic status. Number two, cause and effect of good and evil. Don't expect it to uh, satisfy your, uh, your logic because it will not. Uh, it just doesn't. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And then the third one, God approves honest labor, but remember he is judge. Everything, everything that we think and our motives and our intentions, things that are hidden and our outward deeds and acts, Everything will be judged by God. By God, I'm thankful for forgiveness because when we do mess up and when we do fall into temptation and sin and when we do ask God for forgiveness, He will forgive those deeds and those deeds will not be judged because we have received Christ's pardon. Amen? So I'm thankful for that. So let me leave you with these few sentences that I have. Keep up your hope and prayers. For those of you who have lost jobs, those of you who are stressed out at home, um, I sympathize with you. Keep up your hope and prayers. Number two, fight against discouragement. Discouragement has a way of just wrapping its tentacles around our minds, our thinking, and it blinds us and prevents us from having hope for the future. This is what discouragement down, does. It downs you. It gets its thumb. It presses you under its thumb. It presses you under its foot. And discouragement is very dangerous. So I want to encourage you, by God's promises, fight in your mind, fight against being discouraged, and look at the things that you can be thankful for and count your blessings. The other thing I want to say is do what is right always and everywhere. Always and everywhere, whether with people or alone, do what is right. This is what Ecclesiastes is telling us. And last but not least, do not define yourself by your employment, by your job, but by the scrutinizing and truthful assessments of God's word. In the end, as Ecclesiastes says, we're all going to end up in the grave. And in the end, we're all going to appear before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And with God, we are all on uh, the same plane uh, uh, level, on the same playing field. We're all the same in his sight. He's not going to say, well, you had this job, you had this much money, or you were poor, or you were rich. He's not going to say that. He's going to ask us, what did we do with our lives? What kind of person were you? Were you compassionate towards others? Were you truthful? Were you honest? Did you live according to your conscience? For those of you who have accepted me as your Savior and you know my law, did you, by my grace, live according to my law? Not that we're saved by works, but that that salvation is evidenced by good deeds. He's going to ask those types of questions. Not where were you, or what kind of house you lived in, or how many kids you had or didn't have, or whether you're married or single, or what culture you lived in, or what kind of job you had, or, that, or the things that you had in life. He's not going to ask those types of questions. So keep these things in mind. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that this word, whatever, is often uh, expressed or unexpressed as a background question in Scripture. But Lord, we thank you that in the end, justice and truth and love and righteousness will win out. And Lord, we thank you because we are on the winning side and we know how the story ends according to Scripture. Meanwhile, God, we live by faith and not by sight. Because, Lord, you know that us human beings were tempted to live by sight and trying to come up with scientific answers and empirical answers to the, and cause and effect, etc. And it doesn't always work out that way. So, Lord, help us to live by faith 
and knowing, Lord, that you are working things out according to your will, according to your timing, even though we may not understand. And last but not least, Jesus, in this pandemic crisis, where jobs are being lost and our lives have just turned dramatically and our daily schedules have changed dramatically, help us, Jesus, to be integral people and who we are in our hearts and in our souls. Help us to be the kind of people that you can be proud of, whatever the circumstances may be. May we not be mastered by circumstances, but help us to master them, Lord, by the kind of persons that we are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. May God richly bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath the rest of this day, and have a great week, and we'll see you next Sabbath. At the same time, 1045, for those of you who can join us on Tuesdays and Friday nights at 7 p.m., won't you Zoom with us? Go to TempeAdventist.com, and you will see the information you need there to Zoom along with us. God bless you, and have a blessed day.